we've brought together an amazing range of people from all over a, an exceptionally large continent, Asia. Uh, and I think that the main outcomes to come from it are a sense of what needs to be done to build Asia into a real community. Lessons from the way Europe, of course, did that same job uh, on a smaller scale, admittedly, but also an identification of the sort of issues on which the great Asian powers and the smaller Asian powers can find shared interests. And through the working group sessions in particular at this seminar, I think we've successfully identified issues and started to come to produce serious conclusions. I think that Asia, in its origin, is an artificial European construct, really. Also, since 1945, Asia has been highly divided, uh, particularly as the major countries, China and India, decided to uh, isolate themselves, but also other countries focused on their sub-regions, on Southeast Asia, on Northeast Asia, often on relationships with the United States. But the last 10 years, perhaps the last 20 years, that has really started to change as China and India have opened up their economies, their political systems, really started to uh, expand their interests in getting resources across the Indian Ocean and finding markets all over the place. And as a result, almost against its will, Asia is becoming a single space, a single strategic space. It certainly isn't there yet. And the mentality, the set of values, the way of thinking about things is still very local, national, and sub-regional. But interests and the conduct, particularly on a commercial scale, but also increasingly in foreign policy, is coming to treat Asia as a single whole. And that is what I think governance, public policy, international diplomacy, is going to have to face up to and deal with over the next decade. It really won't come to fruition until perhaps the end of that decade, maybe beyond. But I think what's important is that people should be thinking about it now. I think that um, West Asia, which uh, is to people in Europe and America known as the Middle East, really, but including as far as Iran, um, is getting increasingly involved in um, the Asian picture because of resources, because particularly of the increasing need of China and India to improve their relationships with, for example, Iran, but also the Gulf, uh, in order to secure their resources, to buy them, and as a place to invest in, to have second homes in, to manage their finances in. So West Asia really having been a concept that's only been understood as West Asia in India, really, in the subcontinent, is increasingly looking east uh, and becoming part of the whole scene. I don't think that it's yet ready to be a part of the whole scene in institutional terms, but it needs to be taken into account. I think that the rivalries um, between the great powers of Asia um, are essentially inherent in the overlapping interests, in the history. Um, after all, uh, within the last uh, 70 years, China and Japan have fought a war, China and India have fought a war, China has invaded Vietnam. Uh, so history is really there. Um, in the rivalry, but also in the strategic thinking of the countries. So I don't think that it's a media construct, but it's possible for the media to focus on conflict and potential conflict to the exclusion of what else is happening, which is increasing economic integration uh, and uh, increasing cooperation, therefore, over some common economic issues. So at the same time, rivalry is developing at a strategic and military level and uh, political level, but cooperation in the form of economic integration is happening even faster. So in a way, it's a competition between the strategic rivalry on one level and the economic integration on the other.
I think that there's no doubt that um, East Asian governments in particular, in other words, East and Southeast Asia, think about human rights somewhat intrinsically in a different way from uh, the way in which Europeans and Americans do, uh, and have a greater emphasis on the collective interest, the community interest, versus the individual interest. Nevertheless, as uh, countries have democratized and have become more affluent, uh, in Southeast Asia, for example, in the Republic of Korea, South Korea as we know it, uh, in Taiwan, um, so um, the pressure from public opinion for individual human rights to um, be, be taken more seriously and to be more protected, even as the collective um, is uh, you know, more keenly observed, uh, is definitely um, rising. Uh, and so why haven't we discussed it much at this, at this seminar? Well, partly because there's so many subjects to discuss at this seminar, but also because once you start to include China, um, Myanmar, Vietnam, other countries, uh, there's a danger of getting into um, a, a, a simply a, a, a we're better than you sort of argument rather than a constructive one. Um, but I think that human rights are increasingly important within Asia. They're seen in a slightly different way, but the evolution towards greater individual rights is nevertheless in the same direction uh, as it is uh, in the West. And I believe it will be in the future in China too, as China grows more affluent, but also as public opinion, from the middle class in particular, demands more accountability and more protection of their individual rights. I think that companies in Asia have not traditionally taken social responsibilities as being a serious part of their uh, remit, mainly because the public have not demanded it. Uh, let's look at Japan, where during the high growth era of the 1950s and 60s, uh, terrible environmental scandals such as Minamata disease, the mercury poisoning um, in uh, the uh, bay off, uh, off the coast of Japan, uh, killed people, maimed them for, for many years, uh, and really were more or less disregarded by the courts um, until um, the 1980s. Corporate social responsibility hasn't been a strong concept, but it's growing as uh, countries have got more affluent, as populations have started to become more aware and as the information flow from America and Europe has got stronger uh, and um, Asian publics have started to buy into the same thought. So overall, I think that Asian companies are rather behind on corporate social responsibility, but I think increasingly they're going to face many of the same pressures, particularly because the world is more transparent than it ever was before. Um, when you get up to no good and you cause damage, eventually you're going to get found out.